Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, today, Mother? What's the secret of the dead come back? The Ghost Ship by Richard Middleton Fairfield is a little village lying near the Portsmouth Road, about halfway between London and the sea. Strangers who find it by accident now and then call it a pretty, old-fashioned place. We who live in it, and call it home, don't find anything very pretty about it, but we should be sorry to live anywhere else. Our minds have taken the shape of the inn and the church and the green, I suppose. At all events, we never feel comfortable out of Fairfield. Of course, the Cockneys, with their vasty houses and noise-ridden streets, can call us rustics if they choose. But for all that, Fairfield is a better place to live than London. Doctor says that when he goes to London, his mind is bruised with the weight of the houses, and he was a Cockney born. He had to live there himself when he was a little chap, but he knows better now. You gentlemen may laugh. Perhaps some of you come from London way, but it seems to me that a witness like that is worth a gallon of arguments. Dull? Well, you might find it dull, but I assure you that I've listened to all the London yarns you have spun tonight, and they're absolutely nothing to the things that happen at Fairfield. It's because of our way of thinking and minding our own business. If one of your Londoners were set down on the green on a Saturday night when the ghosts of the lads who died in the war keep tryst with the lasses who lie in the churchyard, it couldn't help being curious and interfering, and then the ghost would go somewhere where it was quieter. But we just let them come and go and don't make any fuss. And in consequence, Fairfield is the ghostiest place in all England. Why, I've seen a headless man sitting on the edge of the well in broad daylight, and the children playing about his feet as if he were their father. Take my word for it, spirits know when they're well off as much as human beings. Still, I must admit that the thing I'm going to tell you about was queer even for our part of the world, where three packs of ghost hounds hunt regularly during the season, and a blacksmith's great-grandfather is busy all night shoeing the dead gentlemen's horses. Now, that's a thing that wouldn't happen in London, because of their interfering ways. But blacksmith, he lies up aloft and sleeps as quiet as a lamb. Once, when he had a bad head, he shouted down to them not to make so much noise, and in the morning he found an old guinea left on the anvil as an apology. He wears it on his watch even now. But I must get on with my story. If I start telling you about the queer happenings at Fairfield, I'll never stop. It all came of the great storm in the spring of 97, the year that we had two great storms. This was the first one, and I remember it very well because I found in the morning that it had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden as clean as a boy's kite. When I looked over the hedge, widow, Tom Lamport's widow that was, was prodding for her nasturtiums with a daisy grubber. After I had watched her for a little, I went down to the fox and grapes to tell the landlord what she had said to me. Landlord, he laughed, being a married man and at ease with the sex. Come to that, he said. The tempest has blowed something into my field. A kind of a ship, I think it would be. I was surprised at that until he explained that it was only a ghost ship and would do no hurt to the turnips. We argued that it had been blown up from the sea at Portsmouth, and then we talked of something else. There were two slates down at the parsonage and a big tree in Lumley's Meadow. It was a rare storm. I reckon the wind had blown our ghosts all over England. They were coming back for days afterwards with foundered horses and as footsore as possible, and they were so glad to get back to Fairfield that some of them walked up the street crying like little children. Squire said that his great-grandfather's great-grandfather hadn't looked so deadbeat since the Battle of Naseby, and he's an educated man. What, with one thing and another, I should think it was a week before we got straight again, and then, one afternoon, I met the landlord on the green, and he had a worried face. I wish you would come and have a look at that ship in my field, he said to me. It seems to me it's leaning real hard on the turnips. I can't bear think what the missus'll say when she sees it. I walked down the lane with him, and sure enough, there was a ship in the middle of his field, but such a ship as no man had seen on the water for three hundred years, let alone in the middle of a turnip field. It was all painted black and covered with carvings, and there was a great bay window in the stern for all the world like the squire's drawing room. 
there was a crowd of little black cannon on deck, and looking out of her portholes, and she was anchored at each end to the hard ground. I have seen the wonders of the world on picture postcards, but I have never seen anything to equal that. She seems very solid for a ghost ship, I said, seeing the landlord was bothered. I should say it's a bit twixt and between, he answered, puzzling it over, but it's going to spoil a matter of fifty turnips, and missus, she'll want it moved. We went up to her and touched the side, and it was as hard as a real ship. Now, there's folks in England would call that very curious, he said. Now, I don't know much about ships, but I should think that the ghost ship weighed a solid two hundred tons, and it seemed to me that she had come to stay, so that I felt sorry for Landlord, who was a married man. All the horses in Fairfield won't move her out of my turnips, he said, frowning at her. Just then we heard a noise on her deck, and we looked up, and saw that a man had come out of her front cabin and was looking down at us very peaceably. He was dressed in a black uniform set out with rusty gold lace, and he had a great cutlass by his side in a brass sheath. "'I'm Captain Bartholomew Roberts,' he said, in a gentleman's voice, "'put in for recruits. I seem to have brought her rather far up the harbour.' "'Harbour?' cried the landlord. "'Why, you're fifty miles from the sea!' Captain Roberts didn't turn a hair. "'So much as that, is it?' he said coolly. "'Well, it's of no consequence.' Landlord was a bit upset at this. I, "'I don't want to be unneighbourly,' he says, "'but I wish you hadn't brought your ship into my field. "'You see, my wife sets great store in these turnips.' The captain took a pinch of snuff out of a fine gold box that he pulled out of his pocket, and dusted his fingers with a silk handkerchief in a very genteel fashion. "'I'm only here for a few months,' he said. "'But if a testimony of my esteem would pacify your good lady, I should be content.' and with the words he loosed a great gold brooch from the neck of his coat and tossed it down to the landlord. Landlord blushed as red as a strawberry. I'm not denying she's fond of jewellery, he said, but it's too much for half a sack full of turnips. And indeed, it was a handsome brooch. The captain laughed. Tut, man, he said, it's a horse sale, and you deserve a good price. Say no more about it. And nodding good day to us, he turned on his heel and went into the cabin. Landlord walked back up the lane like a man with a weight off his mind. "'That tempest has blowed me a bit of luck,' he said. "'The messes will be much pleased with that brooch. "'It's better than blacksmith's guinea any day.' Ninety-seven was jubilee year, the year of the second jubilee, you remember, and we had great doings at Fairfield, so that we hadn't much time to bother about the ghost ship, though anyhow it isn't our way to meddle in things that don't concern us. Landlord... He saw his tenant once or twice when he was hoeing his turnips and past the time of day, and landlord's wife wore her new brooch to church every Sunday. But we don't mix much with the ghosts at any time, all except an idiot lad that was in the village, and he didn't know the difference between a man and a ghost, poor innocent. On Jubilee Day, however, somebody told Captain Roberts why the church bells were ringing, and he hoisted a flag and fired off his guns like a loyal Englishman. Tis true the guns were shotted, and one of the round shot knocked a hole in Farmer Johnson's barn, but nobody thought much of that in such a season of rejoicing. It wasn't until our celebrations were over that we noticed that anything was wrong in Fairfield. It was Shoemaker who told me first about it one morning at the Fox and Grapes. You know my great-grand-uncle, he said to me. You mean Joshua, the quiet lad, I answered, knowing him well. Quiet, said Shoemaker indignantly. Quiet, you call him. "'Coming home at three o'clock every morning as drunk as a magistrate "'and waking up the whole house with his noise. "'Why, it can't be Joshua,' I said, "'for I knew him for one of the most respectable young ghosts in the village. "'Joshua it is,' said Shoemaker, "'and one of these nights he'll find himself out in the street if he isn't careful.' "'This kind of talk shocked me, I could tell you, "'for I don't like to hear a man abusing his own family, "'and I could hardly believe that a steady youngster like Joshua had taken to drink.' But just then in came Butcher Aylwin, in such a temper that he could hardly drink his beer. The young puppy, the young puppy, he kept on saying, and it was some time before Shoemaker and I found out that he was talking about his ancestor that fell at Senlac. Drink, said Shoemaker hopefully, for we all like company in our misfortunes, and Butcher nodded grimly. The young noodle, he said, emptying his tankard. Well, after that, 
I kept my ears open. And it was the same story all over the village. There was hardly a young man among all the ghosts of Fairfield who didn't roll home in the small hours of the morning, the worse for liquor. I used to wake up in the night and hear them stumble past my house, singing outrageous songs. The worst of it, though we couldn't keep the scandal to ourselves, and the folk at Greenhill began to talk of Sodden Fairfield, and taught their children to sing a song about us. Sodden Fairfield, Sodden Fairfield, has no use for rum and butter. Rum for breakfast, rum for dinner, rum for tea, and rum for supper. We were an easy-going lot in our village, but we didn't like that. Of course, we soon found out where the young fellows went to get the drink, and the landlord was terribly cut up that his tenant should have turned out so badly. But his wife wouldn't hear of parting with the brooch, so that he couldn't give the captain notice to quit. But as time went on, things grew from bad to worse, and at all hours of the day you would see those young reprobates sleeping it off on the village green. Nearly every afternoon a ghost wagon used to jolt down to the ship with a lading of rum, and though the older ghosts seemed inclined to give the captain's hospitality the go-by, the youngsters were neither to hold nor to bind. So, one afternoon when I was taking my nap, I heard a knock at the door, and there was the parson, looking very serious, like a man with a job before him that he didn't altogether relish. I'm going down to talk to the captain about all this drunkenness in the village, and I want you to come with me, he said straight out. I can't say that I fancied the visit much myself, and I tried to hint to parson that as after all there were only a lot of ghosts, it didn't very much matter. Dead or alive, I am responsible for the good conduct, he said, and I'm going to do my duty and put a stop to this continued disorder, and you are coming with me, John Simmons. So I went, Parson being a persuasive kind of man. We went down to the ship, and as we approached her I could see the captain tasting the air on deck. When he saw Parson he took off his hat very politely, and I can tell you that I was relieved to find that he had a proper respect for the cloth. Parson acknowledged his salute, and spoke out stoutly enough, "'Sir, I should be glad to have a word with you. "'Come on board, sir, come on board,' said the captain, "'and I could tell by his voice that he knew why we were there. "'Parson and I climbed up an uneasy kind of ladder, "'and the captain took us into the great cabin at the back of the ship "'where the bay window was. "'It was the most wonderful place you ever saw in your life, "'all full of gold and silver plate, swords with jewelled scabbards, carved oak chairs and great chests that look as though they were bursting with guineas. Even Parson was surprised, and he didn't shake his head very hard when the captain took down some silver cups and poured us out a drink of rum. I tasted mine, and I don't mind saying that it changed my view of things entirely. There was nothing betwixt and between about that rum, and I felt it was ridiculous to blame the lads for drinking too much of stuff like that. It seemed to fill my veins with honey and fire. Parson put the case squarely to the captain, but I didn't listen much to what he said. I was busy sipping my drink and looking through the window at the fishes swimming to and fro over landlord's turnips. Just then it seemed the most natural thing in the world that they should be there, though afterwards, of course, I could see that it proved it was a ghost ship. But even then I thought it was queer when I saw a drowned sailor float by in the thin air with his hair and beard all full of bubbles. It was the first time I'd seen anything quite like that at Fairfield. All the time I was regarding the wonders of the deep, Parson was telling Captain Roberts how there was no peace or rest in the village owing to the curse of drunkenness, and what a bad example the youngsters were setting to the older ghosts. The captain listened very attentively and only put in a word now and then about boys being boys and young men sowing their wild oats. But when Parson had finished his speech, he filled up our silver cups and said to Parson with a flourish, I shall be sorry to cause trouble anywhere where I have been made welcome, and you will be glad to hear that I put to sea tomorrow night, and now you must drink me a prosperous voyage. So we all stood up and drank the toast with honour and that noble rum was like hot oil in my veins. After that, Captain showed us some of the curiosities he had brought back from foreign parts, and we were greatly amazed, though afterwards I couldn't clearly remember what they were, and then I found myself walking across the turnips with Parson, 
and I was telling him of the glories of the deep that I had seen through the window of the ship. He turned on me severely. If I were you, John Simmons, he said, I should go straight home to bed. He has a way of putting things that wouldn't occur to an ordinary man as parson, and I did as he told me. Well, next day it came on to blow, and it blew harder and harder, till about eight o'clock at night I heard a noise and looked out into the garden. I dare say you won't believe me. It, it seems a bit tall even to me, but the wind had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden a second time. I thought I wouldn't wait to hear what widow had to say about it, so I went across the green to the fox and grapes, and the wind was so strong that I danced along on tiptoe like a girl at the fair. When I got to the inn, landlord had to help me shut the door. It seemed as though a dozen goats were pushing against it to come in out of the storm. It's a powerful tempest, he said, drawing the beer. I hear there's a chimney down at Dickory End. It's a funny thing how these sailors know about the weather, I answered. When Captain said he was going tonight, I was thinking it would take a capful of wind to carry the ship back to sea. But now here's more than a capful. Ah, yes, said landlord. It's tonight he goes, true enough, and mind you, though we treated me handsome over the rent, I'm not sure it's the last of the village. I don't hold with gentrists who fetch their drink from London instead of helping local traders to get their living. But you haven't got any rum like his, I said, to draw him out. His neck grew red above his collar, and I was afraid I'd gone too far. But after a while he got his breath with a grunt. John Simmons, he said. If you've come down here this windy night to talk a lot of fool's talk, you've wasted a journey. Well, of course, then I had to smooth him down with praising his rum, and heaven forgive me for swearing it was better than the captain's. For the like of that rum, no living lips have tasted save mine and Parson's. But somehow or other I brought the landlord round, and presently we must have a glass of his best to prove its quality. Beat that if you can, he cried and we both raised our glasses to our mouths, only to stop halfway and look at each other in amaze, for the wind that had been howling outside like an outrageous dog had all of a sudden turned as melodious as the carol boys of Christmas Eve. "'Surely that's not my Martha,' whispered Landlord, Martha being his great-aunt that lived in the loft overhead. We went to the door, and the wind burst it open, so that the handle was driven clean into the plaster of the wall, but we didn't think about that at the time, for over our heads, sailing very comfortably through the windy stars, was the ship that had passed the summer in Landlord's Field. Her portholes and her bay window were blazing with lights, and there was a noise of singing and fiddling on her decks. He's gone, shouted Landlord above the storm, and he's taken half the village with him. I could only nod in answer, not having lungs like bellows of leather. In the morning we were able to measure the strength of the storm, and over and above my pigsty there was damage enough wrought in the village to keep us busy. True it is that the children had to break down no branches for the firing that autumn, since the wind had strewn the woods with more than they could carry away. Many of our ghosts were scattered abroad, but this time very few came back, all the young men having sailed with the captain, and not only ghosts for a poor half-witted lad was missing, and we reckoned that he had stowed himself away, or perhaps shipped as cabin boy, not knowing any better. What were the lamentations of the ghost girls and the grumbling of families who had lost an ancestor? The village was upset for a while, and the funny thing was that it was the folk who had complained most of the carryings on of the youngsters who made most noise now that they were gone. I hadn't any sympathy with shoemaker or butcher who ran about saying how much they missed their lads, but it made me grieve to hear the poor bereaved girls calling their lovers by name on the village green at nightfall. It didn't seem fair to me that they should have lost their men a second time after giving up life in order to join them as like as not. Still, not even a spirit can be sorry for ever, and after a few months we made up our mind that the folk who had sailed in the ship were never coming back and we didn't talk about it any more. And then one day, I dare say it would be a couple of years after, when the whole business was quite forgotten, who should come traipsing along the road from Portsmouth but the daft lad who had gone away with the ship without waiting till he was dead to become a ghost? You never saw such a boy as that in all your life. 
He had a great rusty cutlass hanging to a string at his waist, and he was tattooed all over in fine colours, so that even his face looked like a girl's sampler. He had a handkerchief in his hand full of foreign shells and old-fashioned pieces of small money. Very curious. And he walked up to the well outside his mother's house and drew himself a drink, as if he had been nowhere in particular. The worst of it was that he had come back as soft-headed as he went, and try as we might we couldn't get anything reasonable out of him. He talked a lot of gibberish about keel-hauling and walking the plank or crimson murders, things which a decent sailor should know nothing about, so that it seemed to me that for all his manners Captain had been more of a pirate than a gentleman mariner, but to draw sense out of the boy was as hard as picking cherries off a crab tree. One silly tale he had that he kept on drifting back to, and to hear him you would have thought that it was the only thing that happened to him in his life. We was at anchor, he would say, half an island called Basket of Flowers, and the sailors had caught a lot of parrots, and we were teaching them to swear. Up and down the decks, up and down the decks, and the language they used was dreadful. Then we looked up and saw the masts of the Spanish ship outside the arbor. Outside the arbor they were, so we threw the parrots into the sea and sailed out to fight and all the parrots was drowned in the sea, and the language they used was dreadful. That's the sort of boy he was, nothing but silly talk of parrots when we asked him about the fighting, and we never had a chance of teaching him better, for two days after he ran away again, and hasn't been seen since. That's my story, and I assure you that things like that are happening at Fairfield all the time. The ship has never come back, but somehow as people grow older, they seem to think that one of these windy nights she'll come sailing in over the hedges with all the lost ghosts on board. Well, when she comes she'll be welcome. There's one ghost lass that has never grown tired of waiting for her lad to return. Every night you'll see her out on the green, straining her poor eyes with looking for the mast lights amongst the stars. A faithful lass, you'd call her. And I'm thinking you'd be right. Landlord's Field wasn't a penny the worse for the visit, but they do say that since then the turnips that have been grown in it have tasted of rum. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody come back, don't they? That was a ghost ship by Richard Middleton, Richard Barham Middleton, to distinguish him from and the other Richard Middletons. So Richard Middleton was born in Staines in 1882, now Staines upon Thames. It was then in the county of Middlesex, but in 1965 it was transferred to the county of Surrey. I'm sure you're interested in that. Uh, yeah, cause itself Staines upon Thames. No, not just on Thames, but upon Thames. I always thought upon was a bit pretentious. I checked the 1864 Ordnance Survey map. These things you can do on the internet now, and it looks a delightful small town surrounded by fields and woods. But even the satellite image, I was curious enough to check today. I've been to Staines, but um, I can't remember it that well. I just remember the river. Um, anyway, it, it, um, it's still got quite a bit of green land around it. It's part of the green belt. So anyway, I digress from Richard Middleton. So he was born in 1882, and he died in Brussels, in 1911, by uh, just after his 29th birthday, by drinking chloroform with the intent to kill himself. There's not a lot on the internet. There is You can get a, a copy of his short biography by a guy called Henry Savage, who knew him. And it seems that when he knew him, these were just lads who had a good time in their 20s, playing cricket, drinking beer, having japes, like trying to get into the National Liberal Club and things like that. And uh, Henry Savage says that no time could Richard Middleton be accounted insane at all, except perhaps in his final moments. And we don't know why um, he killed himself. It's probably too late to excavate that now. But he was, his literary ambitions were thwarted. So um, he went to a grammar school in uh, in Cranbrook in Kent. And the, the grammar school system was set up for really, it was for middle class people who didn't go to the public school, which is the private school, and um, not for the mass education of the what we used to have, the secondary moderns. This was all before this anyway, and it's all gone now. So, 
but it was a kind of a middle ranking school, I suppose that's what we'll say. Um, he, he, there is a hint that his uh, his childhood was not poverty free. He went to work as a bank clerk from 1901 to 1907, but hated the drudgery of the work. He wanted to be a poet, and in those those years, he considered himself a bohemian and joined a club called the New Bohemians, where he met Arthur Macken. And you know, Arthur Macken is a big deal in the weird stories. Um, admired by Lovecraft, member of the Golden Dawn, Macken. So Macken's quite a, a shining figure. We've done a, we've done a couple of Macken stories. And he was very fond of Middleton and rated him. And he actually, if you go on Project Gutenberg, we can get a free ebook. He actually wrote the preface to the ghost ship story, uh, the ghost ship collection of stories. There are a couple of um, uh, autobiographical excerpts in that collection as well. If you're interested in Middleton, you can read it. Uh, and he rated him. Another guy uh, who rated him, who, whose opinion we should take seriously, was Raymond Chandler, of course. Raymond Chandler, a fantastic prose stylist and great writer. But he thought he was nearly put off writing when he met Middleton because he thought he would never equal his talent. And Arthur Ransom, um, another very um, larger-than-life figure, but famous for his Swallows and Amazons books particularly, and lots of other things as well. But he he had a reference to Middleton in one of his books. So Middleton knew the literary people of his day. He wanted to be a poet. He was successful in having his poetry published. His most famous poem is The Bathing Boy, and it's a bit of a, a paean, I like that word, to healthy young men with hardly any clothes on swimming. And that might just be a thing, or it might be that he was gay. I don't know if he was or not. But certainly there's dark hints that he was disappointed in love. He never made any real money from his writing during his lifetime, even though he is pretty good. Maybe that's when he got to 29 and he just had his birthday and he was looking 30 in the eye that he thought, OK, I'm... he'd moved to Brussels by that time. And this was, seems to be a desperate way of rekindling things for himself. Uh, he considered himself, as I said, a bohemian. He was past bohemian, the fin de siècle had come and gone, and we were heading into Edwardian times, weren't we, at that time? But what, for whatever reason, he sadly took his own life. We've done a Richard Middleton story already. We've done On Brighton Road, which is a very crisp winter story about a tramp, a gentleman of the road. I'm actually reading, dipping into an anthology of called um, When Wandering, which is about walking, and there are lots of excerpts, and it seems in, in those days lots of people were on the road for all sorts of reasons, and it was far more common to walk the length and breadth of the country. And there were professional tramps who went around with their pots and pans and begged food and lived and chose to live like that. So that's, um, that's a good story. It's only short. So who recommended this story, The Ghost Ship, is me. Because I'd read some Middleton and I thought, this is a really great story and one day I'm going to do it. It's a humorous story. I'm, I was always in two minds about whether to include humorous stories. But we did... The Lost Manuscript by Dennis McKellar, and that went down, which is a humorous story, humorous ghost story. And that went down really, really well. So I thought, oh, go on and we'll risk it. This is such a, a light-hearted, funny story. Although he was from Staines, the two stories that we've got of him that I've come across are set in, towards the south coast of England. So I'm guessing at some point in his life he became familiar with the, the southern counties, you know, Sussex particularly both west and east um but this is set in this village and of course it uh, it plays on this trope of the haunted english village which we come across time and time again this idea that merry england is haunted all the time and funnily enough the ef benson story we did uh, how fear departed the long gallery starts off in that humorous vein about an old country house that is haunted by its ghosts and the English residents, English rural residents are so relaxed about ghosts. They're just they're members of their family. So this, of course, is very, very similar in style. And I wonder if uh, one was inspired by the other. When I check, I see that E.F. Benson's story was published in 1912 and The Ghost Ship was published in 1911. Of course, 1911 is the year that uh, Middleton died. Uh, so And it didn't get published before then. So it, it may be that Benson read Middleton's story it's hard to know it's it's a, a very accomplished story with caricatures it also reminded me of uh, 
Stella Gibbons' Cold Comfort Farm, which is a fantastically humorous piece about rural England, published much later in 1932. If you like, uh, if you like this kind of thing, you should read that book. It's really hilarious. Probably a bit non-PC now, but because it makes fun of village idiots and things. I haven't really got much to say about the story apart from how delightful it is and how the turnips tasted of rum. Um, I, I think, you know, maybe the reference to rum is, this is pure speculation, reflects Middleton's love of the bohemian lifestyle and presumably alcohol and possibly hashish or laudanum or whatever. I don't know. I'm just filling in the blanks. I don't know, honestly. In terms of things happening here, I have not returned from the northeast of the USA, from New England and New York City. I went with my daughters and we were there about... Well, it's funny because you lose days and you get days. I think it was about 10, 11 days we flew into Boston. It was hot. And we, I certainly enjoyed retreating into... There's a big Sam Adams pub in the middle of Boston. Uh, it, was, it was nice. It reminded me a lot of England. I thought this actually could be in England. This, there was bits that looked like London. There was bits that looked like Manchester, the more modern bits. There was bits that reminded me of Leith, I suppose, in Scotland, uh, the, the port area, although Bo- Boston port is... is don't be offended, my Edinburgh listeners, is a bit more bustling than Leith, although I love Leith, you know, don't get me wrong. Yeah, it was. It was very European. It felt like a European or a Brit- actually not European, a British city, which so I enjoyed learning about. I didn't know tons about the the history of the English colonies there. You know, this was the Plymouth colonies up at that part. We went to Martha's Vineyard and Cape Cod. Fantastic. Uh, went to Salem, of course, it was just boiling hot. I think um, I didn't do Salem justice because it was so hot and we were wandering around. We went into a couple of the witchy shops there, went to the Salem uh, Witch Museum, and that was interesting to learn about the hysteria that can overcome communities when they start kind of witch hunting and blaming people, a bit like the McCarthy trials. But, you know, as he says, as the museum says, it wasn't certainly just a thing confined to North America, um, that kind of thing. There was more people put to death of being witches in continental Europe and England to a lesser extent, S- Scotland. Uh, and they were obsessed with them, you know. And then we see what's happened, of course, with other groups. They get People get bees in their bonnets and go, oh, it's the, you know, the Jews are doing this. And we and awful, for, awful, awful things do. So we must try and avoid this hysteria of blaming people, although it's not easy and we do see it these days. Anyway, again, I wonder... Um, and then we went down to Providence, Rhode Island. You won't be surprised that I went to Salem and Providence, Rhode Island. And I think in one of the members' only stories I've mentioned, Lovecraft Arts and Crafts, which is a, a weird horror shop in the middle of Way Bossett Street. There's a little arcade just opposite our hotel, in fact, where I was woken in the night by the sound of a crying child three nights on the row. Now, it could be just the child was crying, but you never know, do you, particularly when it was there. And we went for a walk ourselves on College Hill uh, and we decided to walk to Lovecraft's grave in the absolute blazing sun. Uh, and then we got the bus back, partly. It was very hot. It was lovely walking through those lovely houses up there and to and find old Howard's grave. Uh, he's got a square named after him, which we were disappointed to find. is actually not a square. It's a crossroads. It's merely a crossroads near Brown University. Brown University was fantastic. We went up there one night with um, the Ghost Walks, Providence Ghost Walks, and they are a very a professional group of people. Our guide was called Kelly. She was uh, gothically dressed up, and she was obviously had some performing arts background, and it showed, and it was really, really, really well done. And what I liked about it was it wasn't just ghost stories. I've been on a lot of ghost walks across the world, well, mainly in the UK, but also in Krakow. Uh, I would have loved to go on one in Venice, but I couldn't find one. And now in Providence... So it was wonderfully atmospheric, and she talked about Poe. And as I said, the thing was, um, she added in all sorts of historical stuff, uh, not just ghosts, although there was a good sprinkling of ghosts. And the, the setting was wonderful, walking around the campus, the old campus of Brown University and these lovely old streets. The Athenaeum was closed, which would, was a shame, because I would have liked to have gone in there, which is where Lovecraft and Poe, not at the same time, uh, because they were rather decades apart, but they uh, both used that private lending library there. I would have loved to have gone in, but it was shut and uh, it's a long way to go back. You know, people are a little bit embarrassed about Lovecraft uh, because of some of his views, which are absolutely outrageous uh, and don't think for a second I support them because I don't. But my daughter, so I went with Catherine in Imogen and uh, my daughter, I think it was Catherine that was reading that 
something about him that he repented later on in life. I mean, he didn't live that long and he saw some of his old ways. He kind of distanced himself from his old views, which, if true, is nice to know. Um, we come up against that thing about writers where they do things that we don't really approve of. Does that mean we should never read the work? Our painters, you know, engineers. If we found out that a guy invented bridges, had unpleasant habits, would we stay? Oh, I'm not going over a bridge anymore. Or, or you know, I'm not going over that particular bridge because he built it. You know, and I think we've got to be able to separate somebody's creations from them. I say this all the time, but I definitely believe it because otherwise our lives would be so restricted. And we can't police. And the other thing I say when this occurs to me is, you know, the Greeks had this idea that what was beautiful was good. So if you were beautiful, you were good. And we know that isn't the truth, but they certainly believed it. And what we seem to be going into a world is to say that before we can even listen to somebody, their lives have to be above reproach. They, they mustn't have done anything we don't approve of. And of course, what we don't approve of changes. So, But we're pretty prudish in all senses if somebody has been an adulterer. I'm not sticking up for these things. Um, if somebody is embezzled, if somebody has racist views, if somebody, we say, right, that's it, you're gone, you're finished. We are not even going to listen to you. And I think that's a, a misstep um, because you should listen to everybody. And the other side of the coin is if our lives were scrutinised, how many of us, I think Jesus said something about that, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Yeah, so that's that. But yeah, old Howard Phillips is not mentioned much it was interesting the lovecraft arts and crafts shop was clearly quite a hip shop uh, quite a liberal shop uh, um but it was dedicated to howard um yeah i have no problem with that i bought pins we call them badges bought tote bags i think we call them tote bags bought books i'm like please don't buy any books i bought a lead baron the imago sequence and i bought a book by caitlin r keenan the Drowning Girl, which the guy who sold me said it was the best novel he'd read in a long, long time. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm still working my way through about four different books at the moment. Anyway, it's hot here. It's um, I've got I bought a thermometer because I record at the top of the house and it gets really hot here. So it was about 30 degrees. I don't really know what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's 80 something. Not sure the 90. I think it got up to 32, which is 89 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, of course, I didn't say we went to Manhattan because of my, my, my uh, brother Michael lives there and he works. He's American. We're half-brothers. He, um, he works on the American horror show as a, as a grip, so he's in the TV industry. But that is just a coincidence because he's not massively a horror buff, but he happens to be working. So I was well impressed by that. We had a nice time and we're staying in midtown Manhattan, which was a sensory overload with the heat and the noise and the bustle. And as I said, I've been to Tokyo, uh, and I lived in London, and, mm, you know, mid Midtown Manhattan, the time we were there was far more of a whoa than either of those two places. So there we are. Anyway, I can't think of anything else I've got to say. If we're all kind of well at the moment. We're just waiting for rain, which is forecast tomorrow, in fact. So I won't have to go on water the trees in the park behind our house. I can let nature do it, which is a lot less work for me, to be fair. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back. back. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?